Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Thanks for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. My name is Nika Larian, food loss and waste advisor and producer of the USAID Kitchen Sink. Today, we have a very special episode to celebrate food loss and waste theme month on AgriLinks. This is an entire month of content and awareness raising around food loss and waste to celebrate the International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste on September 29th. So today, I will be speaking with Dana Gunders, Executive Director of ReFed. To celebrate Food Loss and Waste Month, Dana and I will be discussing the state of food loss and waste efforts and the role of ReFed. Welcome, Dana. Thank you for joining us today. Could you please introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks so much for having me, Nika. Um, as you mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of ReFed. We are a national nonprofit in the U.S. that is focused on reducing the amount of food that goes uneaten. Um, specifically within the U.S. context. Thanks, Dana. I, I have, uh, I'm a big fan of the work that ReFed does and the great network that it has, so I'm very excited to, to chat with you today. So to kick us off, I, I'd love to discuss with our listeners uh, more about the work that ReFed does to reduce food loss and waste. So to celebrate this Food Loss and Waste Month, can you give us a pulse check on the latest and greatest happening in the food loss and waste space and tell us more about the role that ReFed plays? Sure, well, ReFed really acts kind of as, as a central resource on the topic within the US. And so we do a variety of things in that context. Sometimes we call ourselves the collaborator in chief because we really work across a variety of stakeholders to make connections, to provide information. We host an annual summit on the topic and several networks. Um, so we do a lot of that convening and connecting, but we also really ground ourselves in data. And so we have an online data hub that we call the ReFed Insights Engine. And that has actually six different tools on it that you can and can look up all sorts of things. You can see how much food um, we estimate is surplus here in the U.S. and where that surplus food is going, how much is going to food donation versus um, composting or animal feed. You can look up... Um, our analysis of solutions. We have analyzed 42 different solutions to food loss and waste, and we've estimated how much food they can save, how much they would cost to implement, um, and how much they might save in terms of cost savings or revenue they might bring in, so the financials, as well as impact. We have greenhouse gas estimates, water estimates, and even estimates of how many additional meals might be provided. Um, and then we have other things. We have a directory of over 1,800 um, organizations within the U.S. that are working on this topic. We have a calculator where people can calculate the impact of different steps they're taking. Um, we track investment in the space, and we also track policies. So we have a, a way to look up um, what policies have been passed in different states as well as federal. And then the last thing we do is we actually work to catalyze more investment and action in the space. And so we host a regranting fund that regrants money out on the topic. Um, we host a funder circle, and we are in the process of developing um, new tools and offerings to really serve the business community because so many big food companies have come to us and said, hey, we want to work on this, but um, we're really trying to figure out how to meet all of the demand that's out there. Um, and you also asked about kind of what is the latest and greatest within the space these days. You know, I, I would say my observation, I've, I've been working on this topic for 
um, gosh, almost 15 years now, really. And, um, you know, the amount of interest and attention and work and funding that is going into it now is tremendous as compared with 10 years ago. Um, and we really, you know, see that type of progress. We see that food loss and waste is part of almost every sustainable food conversation that we're part of. Um, and, you know, I would say in, in this year, what we're really seeing is a lot of additional attention to it because of the big role that food loss and waste plays in methane emissions. Um, you know, in the US, um, landfills are the third largest source of methane and food is the largest source of methane within landfills. And so with a new global interest in reducing methane emissions for the climate, for the short-term climate benefit that that can gain for us, we've seen really an increased uh, interest by, by funders, by businesses, by local and state governments in addressing their landfill methane via food waste reduction solutions. Thanks for that background, Dana. As you mentioned, there is a lot of global momentum right now. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the timing of Food Loss and Waste Month, because in September, we also have Climate Week, we have UNGA, we have COP28 on the horizon. So I think it's a really great time to, to really elevate the conversation that we've been having on, on food loss and waste. So I, I appreciate that, that background. I love that you brought up the importance of funding and, and encouraging private sector investment. I definitely want to circle back to that topic um, later on in our episode. Um, but I, you really got at the fact that Refed is a really unique organization working across systems. I like your phrase, collaborator in chief. Um, so can you tell us what do you think makes Refed so unique and successful and what can be done? What can USAID learn from Refed to replicate this model in low and middle income countries? Yeah, you know, I think the thing about working on food loss and waste is that it has so many co-benefits and so many intersections, right? So some people are working on it because of the greenhouse gas emissions. For some, it's a purely financial thing. And for others, it's more about uh, food security or hunger relief, things like that. And so because of that, you get really disparate players that are working on this. And that is a strength, but it's only a strength if you can figure out the way to bring them together. So having an organization like ReFed that can be the hub and, and can have that 50,000 foot view of that systems level view of what's happening, who's doing what, making those connections is really a value add because it helps um, reduce duplication of effort. It brings, um, you know, projects and coalitions together that might not otherwise happen and they may not find each other as easily. And I think with that, you know, it just really cultivates a whole ecosystem and a movement of people working on it. And of course, our data work is sort of the underpinning of that because without the data to help inform where to go, it's, you know, it's really a guessing game. Um, so I think that's where we really see our value is in being that hub that can really kind of take in what's happening across the whole food system and try to accelerate action because of that. Yeah, thank you for, for that insight. I, like I said, ReFed is, is an excellent model. So learning more about why it's so successful can help us replicate this in other countries and other contexts to create that similar hub of, of resources, of data-driven decision-making um, and collaboration in, in other countries. Um, hopefully we can we can do our work as USAID to, to replicate this model. And I know you, you mentioned the importance of funding and investment. So that is where I'd like to wrap up our conversation today by making the business case of why private sector investment in food loss and waste reduction is important. 
one example, USAID is partnering with the private sector by providing co-investment grants through our Feed the Future Food Loss and Waste Partnership Facility, uh, providing one-to-one -one co investment with businesses in food loss and waste upstream to countries that are working to scale innovations and practices to reduce food loss and waste. So, can you speak to how ReFed can inform this private sector decision making around food loss and waste investment? Sure. You know, I mean, um, the benefit of this issue is that it often has a direct financial benefit as well, right? And it, there really are some win-wins to be found. And so I think in, in some cases, um, what we see is that, you know, there might be a large food business and there might be, you know, one or two people within that business who have started to learn more about just how much food might be going to waste in different areas or, or just the impacts of it, that it's a real opportunity to impact the climate footprint of a, a business. Um, and, but those one or two people, you know, may not have the right buy-in across the whole country. I'm sorry, the whole company. They may not know what to do, right, exactly about it within their company. And so, you know, we see our role as helping those people, right, be the champions that um, that they are, and really giving them the tools to take to their to their business, to their leadership. And sometimes it's not their leadership. Sometimes it's the um, the boots on the ground that they need implementing this, right? Um, but to really get that buy-in that they need, so that they can then go forward and often. Once you give them the right information, the business case makes itself because any business that's wasting food within its four walls of operation is losing money because of that. So if there are solutions out there, that aspect is usually a relatively straightforward um, thing to convince people of if you can kind of get over some of the other challenges and, and hoops that are there, right? Um, Sometimes businesses have the right operating procedures, right? They know what to do, but it's just not happening on the ground. And that is where it actually gets pretty tricky because, you know, you might be telling your people to put stuff into refrigeration right away, but they might be on lunch break when it arrives and it sits out on the, you know, in the, in the hot docking station for half an hour before it gets put away. So sometimes we see the biggest challenge is really in implementation of existing policies. You know, another way that we see the private sector getting engaged is through investment. Um, just as with so many other technological advances, it's sometimes easier for a company to invest in a startup that might be developing a solution that can help them rather than trying to develop that solution in-house. And so there are you know, a number of startup companies that we've seen become quite successful um, and are really kind of spreading like wildfire across the food industry in the US because they, they have developed solutions that really help larger businesses um, save money in the end and save food along with it. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I think there's so many ways to get to get engaged. We've seen companies like um, Kroger, which is a large grocer here, actually have their own innovation fund. Um, you know, we just saw Albertsons, another large grocer, adopt a um, an artificial intelligence software that helps them use machine learning to do forecasting better. Um, but we've also seen some really uh, straightforward pilots that have shown great results. Um, there's a, a flour manufacturer here called Bob's Red Mill. They did a, a quick employee um, employee engagement session with like where they just educated their employees on the topic, on how much is going to waste, on all the impacts. And then they asked them, hey, what do you think we should do? Do you have any suggestions? They held a little competition and they got you know, over 250 suggestions. They implemented, the first one that they implemented saved 70% of the waste on a particular manufacturing line. And the, and the suggestion was to tighten a screw more often. 
you know, and, and it was just, you know, tightening it, you know, more times per day than it was currently happening. And so not everything has to be high tech, right? Some of these solutions are really straightforward, but it's hard to see from that high management level. So I really encourage people to ask um, those who are handling the food, what are the challenges? Because sometimes there are some really obvious solutions that they see, but they don't feel like they have the ability to impact. Thanks for sharing those those examples. The, the one about tightening the screw is particularly impactful and I think really gets at your point of the need for collaboration and communication and crowdsourcing different ideas. You mentioned there's a, there's a lot of momentum in the private sector space, a lot of really interesting startups kind of filling in gaps in, in the food loss and waste reduction space. And uh, I, I live in Kentucky, so we, we have Kroger's here. And when I walk in, I see the giant banner of zero hunger, zero waste. So I, I definitely, um, like you said, it's it can be an easier business case to make once you have the data and you see the case for improving efficiency. I think that's that's an argument that's easy to get behind for, for a lot of different companies. So I want to thank you for chatting with us today, Dana, and, and sharing more about the work that Refed is doing. You have been a valuable resource to USAID and, and many others. So I want to thank you for the great network that, that you have established. And I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation with you and Refed and, and continuing to elevate food loss and waste, not only this month and the upcoming events, but really into the future. It's been a really valuable um, collaboration that we've, we've had with you. So thank you, Dana. Thank you so much, Nika, for having me and for all that USAID is doing on this topic. It's really great to see how engaged you all have been, including hosting this podcast. <laughs> Thanks, Dana. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, Ahmed Kablan and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative, and the USAID Center for Nutrition.